Welcome to Two Messianic Jews. I'm really excited about this episode. Today we have Matt Rosenberg. Rabbi Matt Rosenberg, he wrote this new book called Jesus Never Said Anything New, and it's just out. You can get it on Amazon, Kindle, and paperback. I encourage you all to go out and get it, and uh, I'm just so honored to have him here. So welcome to the, to the channel, Matt. Thanks, man. Thanks for yeah, having me. Absolutely. So this is, uh, I love the title, you know, it, it's actually a great starting point to any conversation and really a conversation yeah. starter. You're just reading this in a coffee shop. What, what's that? Um, right. So I really want to know, like, uh, why did you decide to title the book this way? I mean, it's, it sounds for many people could be provocative. Um, but yeah, so just right there. What do you, what do you mean? Jesus never said anything new. Yeah, it's intentionally provocative. Yeah. Um, but I think it's equally true. And I found in conversation and preaching and, you know, the book's written primarily to Christians about Jewish context of Jesus. So um, I was trying to get to the heart of, you know, my, my heroes, uh, David Stern um, in, you know, Jerusalem and his book, Restoring the Jewishness of the Gospel, uh, framed a lot of things for me um, as a kid. And when I first started studying theology myself, it's the same idea that there's a Jewishness that's been removed from the gospel that needs to be restored. Because in order to understand the person of Jesus and to understand what he did and why he did it, what he came for, um, you can't disconnect it from Jewish thought and practice since that's the world um, he was in. But for a lot of Christian theology, it's incredibly disconnected. Um, and so I was looking for a way to, you know, I think I, I went into more specific examples than um, Dr. Stern did. Um, but really the same idea. How do we restore Jewishness back to this very Jewish person who's also the God of the Jewish people um, for a majority of the world that is fully convinced that he's entirely separate from Judaism mm -hmm. and the Jewish people. Um, so I think it just dawned on me um, in preaching and teaching and writing that uh, there's, there's a big, you know, kind of in Christian theology, the big idea, uh, I mean, this is Matt's version of their big idea, is uh, everything Jesus did was new. Um, and it's part of the disconnect. And so as I started to look in, okay, what's actually, is there actually anything that's new? And of course, the two places that come up um, are uh, you have heard it said, but I say, is where people say, well, he's saying, you've heard it said in Judaism, but I say, so these are all new statements. Mm -hmm. um, or the, um, you know, the, the verse, uh, I, I give you a new commandment. <laughs> right. Yeshua says. Uh, so those two places are kind of a starting point. And as I worked through it, I found that the, the but, but I say is, um, according to Jewish theology and in first century second temple Judaism, which is the world that Yeshua is a part of, um, you find contemporaries saying all the same things in Jewish thought. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's nothing new in those statements. So you have to do it with, why does he say, I give you a new commandment, um, but then reiterates you know, Leviticus 19, and you find, I, I think the way revelation works is uh, just because something is revealed to us or we're enlightened by an idea that we either un understood as the opposite to be true, or now it's just something we didn't realize and now we realize is true. Well, it's new to you, but is it new in the universe, you know, I think King Solomon argues in Ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun. There's just the reiteration of the same things. 
Um, and so the more I dig in, have dug into that idea, Jesus never said anything new. There's nothing in his content that is explicitly new. But there's a reframing of what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, his disciples, there's a reframing of what they thought they knew um, that feels new. But the more I look into uh, first century Judaism and read about first century second temple Judaism, the more I find that there's contemporaries, rabbis who are teaching the very same things, but they're not saying I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. No one goes to the father except through me. So is that new? Well, it's strange and it's jarring and it's frustrating. Um, but it, the idea that a savior is going to come, a Messiah is going to come. There's all kinds of opinions of what that actually means, but it's not new. And the reason why that's frustrating to Christian theology is because so much is hinged on the idea that it's totally brand new. But I find for Jew and Gentile that I think our, our faith is more meaningful if it's uh, if we talk about continuity rather than the discontinuity of God starting with the people and starting over is discontinuity. Mm -hmm. Continuity is I made promises to the Jewish people and I will always keep them. Um, yeah. So the, that's the concept yeah so reading your book i actually um also was listening and watching one scholar that i like uh dr gabriella baccaccini at university of michigan and mm -hmm. when he talks to his students about uh second temple judaism he kind of relates it to uh legos like growing up playing legos as a kid so right what he says is like everyone has the same lego bricks they're all dealing with right. the same material but there could be unique uh, different structures and buildings that these different, you could say rabbis or different uh, Jewish right. movements are creating. So it, like when you say, you know, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life, that's like, you could say it's uh, remarkable or, you know, it's, it's different. Like no, no doubt it's different, but new. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's jarring, but the reason why it's jarring has to do with the people's expectation, mm -hmm. not whether what he's saying is new or not. Right, right. Um, yeah. yeah. So even I give you a new commandment, um, you know, love one another as I have loved you. Well, there's two places that that comes from. Love one another is Leviticus um, 1918. And um, as I have loved you is even it's right in the Shema. Mm. It's it. He's saying, keep these commandments as i have commanded you to keep like it's all it's all there um it it's just um you know we we uh there's a for some reason there's a desperation i think for for the for newness when the heart of the gospel is actually in God fulfilling his promises to the Jewish people first so that we could live out the promise that he put on us through Abraham, which is to be a blessing to the nations. And ultimately the blessing to the nations is not Jesus. The blessing to the nations is the Jewish people leading the nations to Yeshua, right? to, to salvation. Yeah. Like that's through Yeshua. So mm -hmm. it's all about him, but I meet, you know, lots of people who are like, well, of course the Jewish people are blessing because they gave us Jesus. Well, that's not really what the text is saying. The blessing is through the physical descendants of Israel, of which Yeshua is a part. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no Gentile in this world who believes in Jesus without the original Jewish apostles giving their lives to preach the gospel to yeah. everyone. But when they preached it, it was in a context, you know, speaking of Legos, it's like the, the removal of Jewish context and Jewish practice 
is trying to take out some of the base blocks and hoping the building mm. still stands. Yeah. Um, and it's, it just, it doesn't work. You have to do more work to prove discontinuity than you have to do to prove continuity. Yeah. Um, but the discontinuity is what everybody knows. So the hard work is trying to uh, unlearn ourselves, <laughs> some of the things we have understood, mm -hmm. and then help, help people to see what, you know, the reality of what's happening in the, in the text itself, particularly, specifically in the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this, this makes me want to ask you, so you say there's two texts that kind of like our uh, cr Christian theology uses to say Jesus brought something brand new. So John 13, 34 through 35, and then Matthew 5, and just the whole Sermon on the Mount, right? You, you have heard right. it said, but I say to you. So I want to just discuss that a little bit. So yeah. um, after reading your book, I did, uh, you, you mentioned Pastor Andy Stanley a lot and uh, interacting with his work. And and mm -hmm. then so I, I just I just had to, to read uh, uh, Irresistible, which which is not about dating, but it's, it's, um, yeah. Right. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a whole, but after reading it, you know, I, I was going to count like, okay, how many times does he say new? It's, it's all over the book, you know, and, and from yeah. reading that book and then reading your book, it's like, I can see even more how much you're interacting with this kind of idea. And so yeah. what, one of the things he brings up, Pastor Stanley brings up is on page 196, talking about John 13. He says, Jesus didn't issue his new command as an additional commandment to the existing list of commands. Jesus issued his new commandment as a replacement for everything in the existing list, including the Big Ten. Just as his new covenant fulfilled and replaced the old covenant, Jesus' new commandment fulfills and replaces the old commandments. So this really gets at kind of like the heart of the idea that you're um, responding to. It's not, I think Pastor Stanley's uh, he's not saying something that radical. I think he's what he's doing is he's articulating really well what a lot of people already believe. So I, yeah. I just want I just want to get your thoughts on. Uh, you gave kind of a positive thing of what you think's going on there, but how would you like respond with that kind of idea he's presenting? Yeah, I mean the the thing I love about um, Andy Stanley is is his clarity mm -hmm. and and simplicity. Um. It's really hard uh, to make complicated ideas simple. And, you know, sometimes when we present a simple idea, people don't realize the work that goes in to, to a complicated idea and trying to make it simple. And, and, and he's just, he's brilliant. Um, and the thing that's interesting to me um, about irresistible specifically is we agree, we a hundred percent agree on the conclusion. <laughs> the conclusion of his book is, um, is he rephrases, you know, uh, love one another as I have loved you to a really great question, which is what does love require of you? Mm -hmm. and, and the articulation of that question is is the heart of the message of what Yeshua is saying, but the way that he gets there um, is to try to prove discontinuity, the separation from Judaism, the temple, and Jewish practice mm -hmm. um, to something else called Christianity. Um, whereas. Uh, I am trying to prove the continuity of the message to the same end, which is why does any of this really matter? Because the truth is in most situations, if we ask ourselves, what does love require of us? We generally know the answer, mm -hmm. like they're not complicated. Um, and, but we use all kinds of reasoning on why we can't, be responsible to do it or there's uh you know factors that keep us from being able to live it out you know we come up with all kinds of justifications so uh, i was uh you know intrigued by the idea that our conclusion is the same but the way that we get there is not um 
and uh, which is why I interacted a few times. And I think you're right, Andy's articulating with more clarity um, the kind of the end, where you get to at the end of what replacement theology is. Now, he doesn't think he believes in replacement theology, which is also interesting because you're literally saying he's replacing right. everything with something new. If God makes promises to the Jewish people and he doesn't fulfill them and he ends his relationship with them because they didn't fulfill their part, I mean, it's what, it's what Paul talks about in Romans when he's speaking to Gentiles, where he says, don't be so haughty that you, the natural branches are dead on the ground. God can raise them up and graft them into their own tree, just the same way he can cut you off. Mm -hmm. Like, if he doesn't keep his promises to the Jewish people, then he's not dependable right. to keep his promises to Gentiles either. Mm -hmm. So the context hinges on the idea that he is always faithful to a remnant of people who do the right thing. And the majority never does the right thing, ever. That's yeah. the nature of majority and minority. Yeah. I mean, in our culture, you want it, it's easier to do what the majority says. But the, the minority or a remnant is always, you know, there's always a faithful group. I mean, the history of the Jewish people, the smallest remnant we've ever had is Joshua and Caleb of their entire generation, two guys. So, uh, you know, he lets it go pretty deep, but he doesn't end, you know, Joshua and Caleb lead their children and their friends' children into the promised land. Um, and if, if God ends his covenants, I, I think the mistake is not, is understanding that the new covenant which when Yeshua says it in the context of Passover, he's quoting Jeremiah 31. Mm -hmm. And the new covenant is just like every other covenant that's first made with the Jewish people. So the new covenant is not all these old covenants are bad. In fact, you know, the word old covenants never used. There's a new covenant. I heard John Fisher said at a conference uh, years ago, that every covenant that God made with the Jewish people was new at the time, <laughs> but, yeah. but they never negate what came before. Mm -hmm. They only add to, they build on. Um, and so the new covenant is of, of Yeshua is building on the covenants, even to the point where he didn't speak to Gentiles at all, but then he sends his disciples to all nations, which was felt new but was the plan all the way from the beginning when he said to abraham i mean it's hard for people to grasp like if if god you know who spoke to moses face to face uh, who made the covenant with abraham who's at the top of jacob's ladder in, in the vision mm -hmm. um who wrestles jacob and breaks his hip like if paul's right and there's only the visible image of the invisible god is the person of jesus then Jesus made a covenant with Abraham and Jesus made a cup. The God of Israel made a covenant with Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and his disciples. Cause it's the same person. Mm -hmm. It's not a new guy. It's the incarnation of the one who's always been there who, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God, he, right? He's there. He's the one making all of the covenants. You know, there's a few times in, in his book um, where he explains what is typical of Christians explaining what Jews believe and is not really what any Jewish person believes or has ever believed. Yeah. So the idea that Jewish people believed then and even now that we could be saved by keeping commandments 
is not a part of Jewish theology. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Christian theology, it's a given that, of course, Jews believed that by keeping the commandments, they could be saved. And so Jesus came to correct that. Um, and it's just simply not, I, I found that, I can't find it anywhere where any rabbi has ever said, the reason why we keep commandments is for our own salvation. Mm-hmm. Um, and if so- I, If I can interject there real quick. It changes, yeah. Yeah, like on this point, um, uh, in 1977, E.P. Sanders, uh, professor, he, he was at Duke for a long time, but he wrote the, the, the like, it changed scholarship, essentially, uh, Paul and Palestinian yeah. Judaism. And I think what's happening is that in scholarship, scholars are recognizing that because of development in Second Temple Judaism, Jewish people believed in God's grace, did the commandments out of a love for Hashem and the mercy and grace he's bestowed upon us. But that scholarship yeah. isn't uh, filtering out to the church. So I think we get this kind of misunderstanding a lot of times that um, from for, well, for pastors but, and, and you know people sitting in, this, in the pews. But Yeah, but I also think it is, I, I can't remember the name of the book. I have a different one in front of me, but the, the editor of the book is uh, Gerald McDermott. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the introduction, it's, it's about the... This? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the title? Yeah, uh, Understand Jewish Truths un- of Christianity. That's right. Yeah. So in the introduction, he says something super interesting to me, which is it's really since the Holocaust that there's a renewed interest of Christians in Jewish thought and practice because the Nazis aren't Christians. Although the perception in the Jewish world is that they are. but. I think what happens in the birth of Israel as a nation in 1948 out of the ashes of the Holocaust and what happens in theology in the 40s, late 40s, early 50s, is there's a group of scholars, Christian scholars, who start to analyze, okay, obviously the end goal of the Nazis is not Christian. But perhaps there are things in our theology that open the door for the direction the Nazis went. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there's a, a digging into, since 1948, there's a digging into first century, second temple Judaism more so than ever before. And they're finding like the new, you know, Sanders is part of the new perspective on Paul, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of starts with Paul. Wait, maybe Paul's actually more Jewish than we think. Oh, maybe Jesus is more Jewish than we think. Oh, wait, we all knew they were Jews, but we didn't realize they were practicing Judaism. Oh, but they were practicing first century Judaism, not modern Orthodox Judaism. So what does that, how does that play out? And even in the middle of all of that is the birth of, modern messianic judaism of which you and i are both a part so when we talk about you know 48 and 67 when um the reunification of jerusalem and how that ties into what god is doing in a movement of jewish people who are believing in jesus again and practicing judaism Mm -hmm is I'm realizing now is also related to something God is doing in the world um, within Christian theology where I'm hanging out with pastors and people, um, scholars who already understand um, most of what we're trying to present Mm -hmm. from a messianic perspective, but they're missing the gaps that we're able to fill in are in the observance, in our observance of Judaism while following Jesus that they don't do. So they just don't know, Um, you know, so there's, there's guys like there's two pastors here in Seattle, Chris Manginelli is a pastor of a four square church and 
my friend Aaron Gray is a, a pastor uh, of a church and uh, Tim Ross is in Embassy City Church in Irving, Texas and Preston Morrison is in um, is at Gateway in Scottsdale, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And in relationship and conversation, David McQueen in Abilene, Texas. And like, there's this whole growing number of guys that I've met over the last, uh, men and women that I've met over the last few years that kind of had, okay, so I think I'm missing this piece. Can you just fill it in? Yeah. And I'm surprised at how much they already know. Like I thought I was supposed to teach everybody what they didn't know but they already know why do they already know because it's something god's been doing since the f late 40s that's like those building blocks like legos it's you know we we exist as a, a messianic judaism exists as a community in relationship to the things that god is doing but for like my dad's generation my dad's 68 and has been in ministry for you know 30 years and when he first got started there were n not only were there no pastors that understood the pastors that they were in relationship with were trying to correct the heresy of judaizing hmm. like you can't practice judaism if you believe in jesus and you know there were people all over the world at the same time jewish people saying that doesn't really make sense though because if jesus is jewish <laughs> right yeah. so and the stories are crazy and like you know we're talking like the early 60s you got like you know ray gannon in la and marty waldman in dallas and dan juster in baltimore and you know the turnoffs in cincinnati and then philadelphia and you know uh and they're all like they all have the same thought at the same time. Mm. Yeah. Like that's so cool. Huh? I feel like we could still be Jewish, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And, and I think part of the historical perspective of that is it's, we, we just get to be a part of what God is doing. And because they work so hard to develop a Jewish identity for their children, you know, we don't struggle. Like I've never struggled with my identity as a Jewish person. Um, I think around eight years old, I, I was shocked to find out that uh, not all Jews believed in Jesus. I was like, I don't understand. Why wouldn't they believe in our Messiah? Like it was very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, but because we're not trying to form identity and identity was already formed for us, you know, it's a, it's standing on the shoulders of, um, uh, of the hard work that they put into identity, but then all these pastors are all experiencing kind of the same, no, it totally makes sense that Jewish people should remain Jewish. And that's feels new. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. But of course it's not. Cause that's what, Yeshua and the disciples were doing in the first place. <laughs> yeah. So, so on this, on, on John 13, um, yeah. you know, so, so pastor Stanley is saying it's a replacement of all the other commandments. And what you're saying is that in your experience with churches that, and pastors that they already are like three fourths the way there of where, of what, and you're just bringing them a little further. So what, what is it that you're, um, or do you have to point out that uh, Jesus's commandments or his commands, specifically John 13 or, or Matthew 5, 17 through, you know, the, the chapter, um, like what's effective, I guess, in communicating that one fourth, pushing them over and saying, this isn't a replacement. This is in continuity with the Hebrew scriptures and Jesus is practicing Judaism, encouraging his Jewish followers to continue with this. Um, like it's no long, it's not obsolete. It, you know, we're, this is still good. Like what's, what, what's, what's it that you're, you're pointing out? Yeah, I mean, you know, talking about Andy Stanley, I've understood that his, you know, his real passion like yours is apologetics. And he's he's trying to to uh, reach people who are disenfranchised uh, or deconstructing with the church or deconstructing their faith. So they grew up in church, but they left church because the Old Testament's weird. Um, and um 
his apologetic is trying to leave the Old Testament really just for a minute and say, let's focus on the resurrection. Because if the resurrection is true, then you'll believe everything else, mm -hmm. right? But I'm not going to get you to believe in the resurrection by trying to convince you that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. So let's just leave that. Let's focus on. He's right. He's right there. <laughs> From an apologetic standpoint, yeah, right? Yeah. You you start with the resurrection, yeah, and you work backwards. Like that's but a lot of people are trying to start with, you know, creation versus evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're it's it's not that they're wrong, it's it's just the wrong place to start. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I appreciate that um that perspective and agree. Um, but as people are deconstructing their faith, you know, which is true for like lots of my friends and your friends that grew up in Messianic Judaism, people are deconstructing faith. I think it's an, it's an, it's an awesome opportunity to set the foundation, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's simple things like the Pharisees aren't evil. Um, and, and people don't realize how much a simple idea like that affects every, how you read, absolutely. um, yeah. the text, um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is the, is Luke 15, which is the, you know, three parables, the 99 sheep, the, the lost sheep, the not the lost coin and the prodigal, which is really about two sons not just the prodigal. So there's three stories that Yeshua tells. And why does he tell it? Well, it says in Luke chapter 15, verse one, that the Pharisees were angry that he was eating with sinners. So he tells three stories. And the way we typically, like I've preached the story, people in commentaries, we actually reverse the point of his story, the point of those three stories. The point of the lost sheep is not that he goes to find the one lost sheep. The point of the story is I'm is that he leaves the 99. <laughs> and he's saying to people who are, so if they're angry because he's spending time with sinners, it implies that they don't believe that they're sinners, <laughs> mm. right? Yeah. That they're somehow righteous and without sin. And so his answer is three stories. I'm going to leave the 99 because they don't need me. And I'm going to go to the one who does. Mm. I'm going to leave the coins that the woman has in her hand and go after the one coin who needs to be found and knows he needs to be found. And then he tells a parable of the two sons. And the two sons are one is a prodigal, which the definition of prodigal is actually spends all his money. Not that he runs away. He goes and spends all of his money. But the end of the story and the point of the story is the older brother, not the younger brother. And the older brother, once his brother returns, says, you know, to the father, I stayed here and did everything I was supposed to do. And you've never killed the fatted calf for me. And the father just says, look, your brother is lost. Now he's found. Just come into the party. And the story ends without resolution. We don't know if the brother goes in. We don't know if he stays out. Mm -hmm. But Yeshua is standing in front of people. You know, you have to understand a little bit about inheritance in the ancient Jewish world, in the ancient Near East. Inheritance isn't about getting the stuff. Inheritance is about the responsibility to provide for the people in your house. Mm -hmm. So the younger brother and the older brother both want their father dead. The younger brother comes and says, I just want you dead now. So I'll just take my part. The older brother is doing everything he's supposed to do through compliance, but hates every minute of it and is really just waiting for his father to die so that all of it will be his. And the dilemma is this is a, Tim Keller wrote an awesome book called The Prodigal God, and he breaks down some of this, 
stuff about the story. He says, somebody goes to look for the lost sheep. Somebody goes to look for the lost coin. Nobody goes to look for the prodigal. And the implication in the story, and if you understand inheritance in the ancient Near East, it was the older brother's responsibility to go find his brother. Mm. It's the older brother's responsibility to throw the party when his brother returns. Because the father says it to him in the story. Everything I have is yours. Like, you're going to be the father of the house when I die. So you are supposed to not only attend the party, you're supposed to be the one throwing it. And it's a little bit of a shift in context based on what we know about the ancient Near East and what Yeshua is even arguing, which is these leaders of Israel, which if Jesus is God, he's really saying, I have given you the authority to serve my people but you can't serve them well if you believe you're righteous and all of them are sinners. So here's three stories, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And then unfortunately what happens is in Christian theology is they grab a piece of something that's right. And like Martin Luther has a whole thing on the prodigal where the Jews are the old, the Jewish people are the older brothers and God is leaving them, <laughs> yeah. right? Which is also not what Jesus is saying. No, He's correcting the Pharisees as ones he has given authority to serve the people to do what they're supposed to do. And even more to do what they already know they're supposed to do. Like it's not new information. He's saying yeah. to them, how did you get to a point where you think you're more righteous than the people I put you in leadership over to serve in order to bring them back to me? So the way you chose to do that was separate yourself entirely from them and not even eat with them. So I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to eat with them. And when you get mad at me, I'm going to tell you three stories of why you shouldn't be mad at me. And why I'm inviting you into the party as much as I'm inviting everyone. Andy and I agree at the end. It's like, no, I mean, what does love require of you is not a hard question to answer. It's hard to do what the answer dictates. And that's because we're human. <laughs> and we don't want to do what we're supposed to do. Yeah. For the point of, I guess, um, like I, I, reading his book is the idea of like yeah. loving other people is essentially loving God is exactly what, what Jesus teaches. But the yeah. specific pra Jewish practices that we find uh, in the Tanakh and then also just the respect Yeshua had for, you know, Jewish tradition, being in the synagogue and wearing tzitzit and, you know, all these yeah. things. Um, that seems to be lost when, when you say this has all been replaced and now you filter everything through loving other people, which is a lot of times uh, it's, it do, you don't need the commandments. You don't need uh, the mitzvot to, uh, to do that. When Yeshua says, um, do not think I've come to abolish, Matthew 5, 17, do not think I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And I tell you until heaven and earth pass away, which is not yet, because right. we're still sitting here. Until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter shall ever pass away from the Torah until all things come to pass. Um, and then the harder part of, therefore, whoever breaks these commit, whoever breaks one of the even least of the commandments and teaches others to be the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them, this one should be called great. Mm -hmm. um, for I tell you, unless you're, and this is, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Torah scholars, you shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. So most people read that as the Pharisees and the Torah scholars were righteous and believed they were righteous, but they weren't. And so we have to have a better righteousness than them. But that's not what Yeshua is saying. Yeshua is saying, I tell you, unless you understand that where the Pharisees and the Torah scholars got it wrong, you also get it wrong. 
Hmm. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven because then we negate things we ought not to negate uh you know in like the beatles theology of all you know all you need is love but love is the whole is what dictates the giving of the commandments the observance of the commandments like he loved us first so we're going to do what he commanded us to do not because we're earning anything from it but because it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. well what do you do when you mess up you repent right so do you repent if you eat bacon yes but is that really a sin i mean i'm unclean till evening it's not actually called a sin in the scriptures but as a jewish person he asked me not to that's so. the cure that's the cure right there you said as a jewish person right so a lot of people yeah. re reading this and and hear your ideas right but they miss the part of yeah. your book where you say gentiles don't have the same obligations as jews uh it could be confusing and yeshua totally. is speaking to this audience and a lot of uh you know in a church you know it's like wait he's speaking to me and i'm supposed to keep these commandments you get into this one law theology so how would you go right. about um explaining uh this idea that there is a distinction in calling uh, that you talk about in the book for gentiles and yeah. jews and their relationship with the law yeah so the new covenant first has to be to the jewish people so that the jewish people can then do what we're supposed to do which is extend the covenant to the nations without the same obligations that jewish people have this is the hardest mm -hmm. the hardest part to unravel for people because everybody wants we should all have the same requirements. Yep. It's like a fairness thing. Yeah, like there's a hierarchy some things of Jews and Gentiles. And, yeah. yeah, and if something's required of you, then it should be required of me. But if it's yeah. not required of me, then it shouldn't be required of you. Mm -hmm. And that's just a simple misunderstanding of the Torah in the first place, which has always had categories. You know, there's commandments for men, there's commandments for women, there's commandments for the priesthood. There's commandments only for the high priest. There's commandments if you're in Jerusalem. There's commandments for outside of Jerusalem. There's commandments for the diaspora. Uh, there's commandments for seasons of life. There's commandments for children. Yep. There's commandments for parents. There's commandments for grandparents. If you never become a parent, you don't ever have to keep those. Nobody, including Jesus. And this is like, this is hard for people because people say all the time, Jesus kept all the commandments no he didn't <laughs> he kept perfectly the commandments that applied to him right right there was no menstrual it's very cycle different or like that. right he didn't yeah. deal with the menstrual cycle he never became a parent so he never kept those he's not a priest he didn't involve himself in the sacrificial system like there's there's nobody has ever kept all of them because it's a misunderstanding of the purpose of the Torah in the first place. There's categories of like sexual sin, which is a list in Leviticus 18 um, that applies to everyone. And it applies to everyone because the disciples put it in the list that applies to everyone in Acts 15. Every, everybody should stay away from sexual immorality. Well, what is sexual immorality? Well, there's a list. So follow the list, right? Which it was also my bar mitzvah portion, which is super awkward at 13, is to stand up and say, do not have sex with your mom, do not have sex with your aunt, do not have sex. <laughs> and they're all like looking at me, oh, so weird. Uh, how, but, how, was, how was that Darash? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So basically don't do anything that you wouldn't do anyway, because that's gross. Uh, so, but it's also why morals and ethics change over culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so those, but those things can't, even when culture shifts, you still can't have sex with your mom. <laughs> like that's yeah. part of, um, you know, the application and then Jew and Gentile, you know, male and female, Jew and Gentile, they're, they're just, there are different things that we're supposed to pay attention to depending on where we come from. And it doesn't mean Gentiles can't keep commandments that they yeah. want to keep. It just means you, you have to 
you should take into consideration what you're actually doing and whether it's a conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit or something you feel like you have to do for a reason that doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's, we all decide, I'm just going to do this because the Holy Spirit told me to. And then it's like, but did he? <laughs> uh, okay. I don't so, know. So would you say then that it's like a covenantal responsibility for Jews to observe the Torah because this is what what's God given us as people, but for Gentiles, totally. it's not a covenantal responsibility, but they have the freedom to participate, you know, within our community, observing Shabbat, the festivals, um, kind of like, I mean, I would assume like at, at your congregation, uh, Jew and Gentile worshiping together. Yeah. I mean, the danger is always, um, you know, there's, there's, I've just found there's, there's well-meaning Gentile believers in every Messianic congregation that believe that they were taught wrong and that Gentiles are in sin for not keeping the commandments. Yeah. And we, we can't abide by that because it's not true to the text. In my ministry, I've, I've helped a lot of Gentiles who came to Messianic Judaism because they thought everything was wrong, find freedom in the idea that they're not obligated to the same things that we are obligated to. But I think there's something important um, that I think we're meant to press into more as a Messianic community. It's not shunning Gentiles who want to keep practices of Messianic Judaism. But it is coming to a healthy place of understanding that there are obligations that are meant for us as a people with a specific purpose. And there's a lot of room within those obligations for all of us to actually practice them in different ways without judgment mm -hmm. in you're not keeping Judaism right, or you're not doing what I'm doing, so you must be wrong. Like there's a lot of room in the design of what observance is um, and helping everybody understand the importance of identity connected to relationship um, with the God of our fathers who's trying to help us see ourselves the way he sees us. But we get distracted by things that we think we're supposed to do or things that you're doing wrong that are embarrassing to me mm -hmm. because you know what kind of messianic jew has a bruce lee poster behind him it's embarrassing right <laughs> that's how some people i love bruce lee so i'm not embarrassed by it at all yeah. uh, but you know that's yeah, it's, yeah. It, there's presuppositions we have with each other that are not biblical at all mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good that's while, good while we argue that everything in my life is biblical, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. come on, that's, it just can't be true. Every, it's, yeah. it's harder than that. It's not, it's never that clean. It's mm -hmm. never right and wrong. It's never either, or it's almost always both end. It's like, uh, there's tension, which Andy talks about all the time in his messages. There's, there's tension that we're trying to get away from that God designed for us to hold. Yeah. And we're like, but I don't want to hold the tension. So I just, you, you drop one side or the other, but, but the tension's actually where, where we're supposed to live. Keeping commandments is not supposed to be easy. The two commandments, which was not new and Jesus broke them down to two because mm -hmm. all the other rabbis, at the same time, we're breaking down the same way. Yep. You know, all the commandments fall under two categories. They either have to do with loving God or loving your neighbor. And we get stuck on who is my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Which one am I really obligated to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Because that person or that color or that culture or that, they're not really my neighbor. Right. It's like a, and God's like, oh, so simple. Just yeah. love God and love everybody. <laughs> yeah, right? this is this is what I like about your book. You talk about how like, you know, God is, Yeshua is the author, of course. He's the God of Israel who like 
who's the inspiration behind the Tanakh, and he came on the scene yeah. to say, that's, that's, what I, that's what I meant when I said it. And so yeah. in John chapter 13, when he says, love one another as I have loved you, it seems like he's elaborating on the exact intention he had behind it. Yeah. Like, what's the point of keeping anything mm -hmm. if, if you're not kind, if you're not generous, mm -hmm. if you're not full of grace and truth, if you're not, you know, it's, it's the tension of John chapter one, when it says Yeshua is, is full of both grace and truth. He's the embodiment of everything that's right. And we're supposed to follow his example, mm -hmm. being imperfect people that are going to do it wrong. Yeah. So how do we give grace to ourselves while searching for truth? from the one who's both the fullness of grace and truth together. Yeah. It's, it's supposed to make you go, ah, that's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is hard. That's, <laughs> that's by design. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's hard, it, it's why you end up with minorities and not majorities because people over the course of history people run away from heart yeah it's it's not just millennials fault <laughs> everybody <laughs> everybody runs away from the hard thing because it's part of what makes us human mm -hmm. and it's part of the love that god has for creation to say i'm never gonna give up on loving you the way i want you to love me and you know, I love John 17 is like, he was about to die. And he just says to his disciples, which feels very parental. Cause I say it when I go on a trip, if I'm going to go on like a trip to Africa, I say to my three kids, please just love each other and love your mom and be kind to each other <laughs> while I'm gone. And Yeshua's is like, guys, please just love each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's I right. have to leave. And I'm going to come back in the meantime, would you please just love each other? Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's just hard. Yeah. So. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I want to encourage everyone to pick up Matt's book on Amazon. It's on Kindle also, right? Yep. Yeah, sweet. Okay. Well, yeah, I appreciate all the work you're doing and uh, I, I play blessings on restoration. And so right now, I just want to say that if you enjoyed this content, you found it helpful, please give this video a like, share it, subscribe. I'll, it's down. You can click on the, the buttons below. And if you have anything to share, you want to add your thought, you disagree with something Rabbi Matt said, you disagree with something I said, you think it's great what we said, leave a comment below. You could also email us at two messianic jews at gmail.com that's two t-w-o messianic jews at gmail.com thanks for watching and see you next time